اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم لیکچر سکس فروم اس مسائل علیہ السلام بک حقیقت الوحی آن ڈیوائن ریولیشنز او وحی ہیڈ اینڈیڈ ان لیکچر فائیو بٹ دا بک ہیڈ کنٹینیوڈ ود امپورٹنٹ اسوسیٹیڈ میٹرز <clears throat> the first of these dealt with before was the essentialness of belief in the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam along with Tawheed the second part of the Muslim Kalima and the way to enable progress in worship and faith <clears throat> in the last lecture this subject was begun Also, Holy Quran is a guidance for the righteous, taking them, them on to extraordinary steadfastness, which Promised Messiah says is moving from simple belief to enlightenment and going on to witnessing and beholding God Himself. This includes praise and glorification of God, repentance, seeking forgiveness, and invoking the rood on the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sacrificing for the Almighty was also a means of enlightenment, preferably sacrificing what you hold dear, including oneself. Promised Messiah alayhi wa sallam says, True Tawheed can only be realized through the Word of God. Any other means cannot ever be free of idolatry. Promised Messiah al-Islam also explained the experience of receiving Wahi by feeling a kind of faintness, then receiving the words of God. Converse with Satan is completely different on the other hand. Promised Messiah al-Islam explained that the foolish misinterpret verses like chapter 2 verse 63 to say belief in the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not essential. However, belief in Allah means that it includes belief in the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Perfect Tawheed is not attainable except by submission to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The postscript section of the book continued by giving answers to some misgivings in the form of questions posed and their answers. The last time I covered the first six of the nine questions posed. I now, can, I now continue with the remaining questions and answers as lecture six. Question seven was, what is meant by The message has been conveyed. The answer to question 7 says, The Promised Messiah al-Islam began by saying, and I quote, There are two essential requirements in conveying the message. Firstly, the one who has been sent by God should inform the people that he has been sent by God and warn them of the errors of their ways, that they are wrong in such and such of their beliefs or are deficient in such and such of their practices. Secondly, he should establish the truth of his claim with the help of heavenly signs and arguments based upon logic and scriptural evidence. End of quote. Then, Promised Messiah al-Islam continued 
this in further detail. He said, Such has been the way of Allah, whereby Allah first grants his prophets respite, so that their fame can spread to a large part of the world, and people get to know of the claim. Thereafter, he proves their truthfulness by means of heavenly signs, rational and scriptural arguments. God brings about fame in extraordinary ways to bring the arguments to perfection with manifest signs. Messengers are given fame by the will of God himself. His angels descend upon the earth and instill into the hearts of people that they are not on the right path, making them search for that right path. God also creates conditions that the news about his Imam of the age reaches the people. With modern communications, a person can become well known throughout the world. So how can it be the elect of God should not become renowned in the world but remain obscure? The writing and dissemination of books had become so very easy in his time, which were non-existent even a hundred years previously, and people were less ignorant and illiterate because schools had been widely established. In addition, Promised Messiah said he had personally communicated the message by visiting cities in the Punjab and India and holding large gatherings and had written over 70 books in different languages such that about 100,000 copies were published in Muslim countries. He had also published many more pamphlets such that over 300,000 people had then accepted him. People of foreign lands were less aware of his jamaat, but the message had reached American and European countries such that many in America had joined and several US newspapers published his prophecies about extraordinary earthquakes. In one long footnote on page 207, Promised Messiah Islam detailed the extraordinary faith and steadfastness of Malvi Sahib Zada Abdul Latif and his martyrdom for the sake of his faith in Afghanistan. This completes the answer to question 7. Question 8. Although we believe that mere barren tawheed, belief in oneness of God, cannot ensure salvation, and that no one can attain salvation by performing any deeds after having distanced oneself from the obedience of the Holy Prophet, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, yet we beg to ask, what are the meanings of the verses cited by Abdul Hakim Khan, for instance. Verse 1, chapter 2, verse 63. Surely the believers and the Jews and the Christians and the Sabians, whichever party from among these truly believes in Allah and the last day and does good deeds, shall have their reward from their Lord. Second verse, nay, <clears throat> whoever submits himself completely to Allah, while he is excellent in conduct, shall have his reward with his Lord. Chapter 2, verse 113. And the, and the third verse, come to a word equal between us and you, that we worship none but Allah, 
and that we associate no partner with him, and that some of us take not others for lords beside Allah. Chapter 3 verse 65 The answer to question 8 given by Promised Messiah is as follows. Promised Messiah emphatically wrote that these verses do not mean that salvation can be achieved without believing in the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What the verses are really saying is that salvation cannot be achieved without believing in Allah, the One, without any associate and believing in the last day. Total belief in Allah is only possible when one believes in his prophets as they are expressive of his attributes. And because the existence of anything is not proved until its attributes become apparent. So, without the attributes becoming apparent, the recognition of the exalted Maker stays deficient. For instance, the attributes that He hears, speaks and knows the unseen cannot be believed except through a messenger and need to be verified and substantiated through observation. Only a messenger can present his words and provide a specimen of his speech. So only prophets provide his speech to us. It is also necessary to understand the Holy Quran in detail. For instance, Holy Quran verses are of two types. First is the Muqamat verses, categorical and explicit type of verses, such as chapter 4 verse 151 to 152, which explicitly says that those who do not want to believe in God and His Messenger and want to separate God from His Messengers, these indeed are confirmed disbelievers who will get and humiliating punishment. Such are clear categorical verses. The second type of verses are the mutashabhiyat, allegorical or metaphorical. Their meanings are not so clear or easy to understand. Persons afflicted by hypocrisy focus upon such verses rather than the clear Muqamat verses in order to misinterpret their meanings to accord with their own perverse understanding. The Muqamat verses are the most plentiful and absolutely clear and obvious in meaning. To deny these leads to evil results. The then Hindu sect of Brahmas believed in God but denied the prophets and the word of God. They believed God hears but does not speak. If he hears, surely he also speaks. If his speaking is not established, then his hearing can also become doubtful. Such people in effect become atheists by denying God's attributes which have existed since eternity and clearly demonstrated by prophets <clears throat> So denial of attributes requires denial of the very existence of God. This analysis shows that belief in Allah requires the critical belief in prophets salam, as without them God is left imperfect and incomplete. A distinguishing feature of Muqamat is also that they are supported by practical evidence, namely the testimony of prophets of God supporting them. All scriptures support belief in God as well as insist upon his messengers. 
Promise Messiah al Islam adds on page 212, and I quote, and it is the hallmark of the mutashabihat that if they are misinterpreted in a sense which contravenes the categorical verses, discord becomes inevitable and they would contravene other verses that are in the majority. No contradiction is possible in the word of God. Therefore, the few need to be harmonized with the majority. End of quote. Promise Messiah Islam then says, if any doubt still exists, we must restrict ourselves to the sense in which God Almighty has used the words Allah. Allah can be solved by looking at the definition of the word Allah in the Holy Quran. It says that Allah is the God who sent down books, prophets and the Holy Prophet وسلم, so that people are enabled to attain the spiritual ranks reserved for those who follow the noble prophets. Noble Prophet Promise Messiah then says on page 212, I quote, but we must restrict ourselves to, to the sense in which God Almighty has used the word Allah throughout the Holy Quran from beginning to end. Namely, He it is who sends the messengers, prophets and books, is the creator of the earth and the heavens and is endowed with such and such attributes and is one without any partner. End of quote. Promise Messiah Islam notes that those never having access to God's words will be judged according to their knowledge, intelligence and understanding, but they will not achieve the ranks bestowed upon the followers of the Holy Prophet. A grace from God is bestowed upon whomsoever He wills. Promise Messiah al Islam emphasizes that it is a travesty when hundreds of verses say that Tawheed alone is insufficient for salvation without belief in the Holy Prophet. Abdul Hakim is ignoring all those verses and, just like Jews, insisting upon one or two misinterpreted verses. If everyone followed him, Islam would disappear from the world. Promise Messiah al-Islam says on page 213, I quote, If it were true that everyone can attain salvation, through his own fancied version of the oneness of God, then rejection of the Prophet would be no sin, nor would apostasy do anyone any harm. Thus, it should be remembered that there is not a single verse in the Holy Quran which relieves one of the obedience to the noble Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, end of quote. Promise Messiah al -Islam also advises that even if we accept the misinterpretation of two or three verses contravening hundreds of others, even then those two or three should give way to the multitude of verses rather than adopt apostasy as there is not even one contradiction in the words of Allah but only a distortion of understanding and darkness of one's nature. We should interpret the word Allah as he himself has done and not, like the Jews, create different interpretations. The Holy Quran affirms that one who truly believes in God is led to belief in his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his heart opens up to accept Islam. Of course, sincere belief by a non-Muslim in God 
can earn him salvation through the means that God grants him the ability and opens up his heart to believe in his messenger وسلم, as well. Pure Tawheed cannot be achieved completely without following the Noble Prophet وسلم, as the attributes of God cannot be observed except through the mirror of the revelation of prophethood. This is why prophets were sent to teach Tawheed and it was not left to human reason and intelligence alone to work it out. Philosophers have never fully grasped pure Tawheed as they are tainted by pride, arrogance and conceit and pure Tawheed demands negation of the self which they cannot achieve. I finish the answer to question 8 with Promised Messiah al-Islam's own words on page 216. I quote, Word of God Almighty has repeatedly admonished man to be grateful to God who sent messengers and taught him Tawheed. End of quote. This completes the answer to question 8. Question 9. What should we think of those who opposed the Holy Prophet وسلم, with good intentions or still do, that is, those who do not acknowledge him as the messenger but believe in the oneness of God do good deeds and abstain from evil deeds. The answer to question 9. Promised Messiah begins the answer with these words. I quote, The proof of a person's good intention lies in the resultant satisfaction. Since one cannot find satisfaction in any religion other than Islam, what would be the proof of good intentions? Look at Christianity, for example. They are so openly making a human being into God, and that human being too, who is the object of relenting suffering. End of quote. Promised Messiah Islam then deals with the Arya Samajists, who produced no proof or argument for the existence of their Parmeshwar. They say he is not the creator, nor can he be recognized by studying his creation. He showed no miracles, not even during the time of the Vedas. And so, Parmeshwar cannot be proved through miracles. They also give no evidence to prove his attributes, such as hearing, speaking, being all-powerful or the bestower. So the Parmeshwar is merely an imaginary one. Even Christians have put a seal on their God for revelations. So how can belief in such gods ever be reassuring? God has clearly manifested the truth of the noble messenger. So whoever turns away from him cannot be said to have good intentions. Promise Messiah al Islam said on page 218, I quote, Therefore I consider it absolutely impossible that anyone can prefer some other faith to Islam on the basis of reason and fairness. End of quote. Promise Messiah al Islam said that only naive and ignorant people learn under the dictates of their lower selves that Tawheed is enough for them and so it is not necessary to follow the Holy Prophet وسلم, It is a Prophet who is the mother of Tawheed from whom Tawheed is born and the existence of God inferred from him. If a person is capable of comprehending the oneness of God and prophethood 
He cannot be excused from denying Islam and he cannot be said to have good intentions. God manifests signs in every age to support Islam. So how then can good intentions combine with disbelief? Promised Messiah elaborates upon this on page 221 as follows. I quote, A disbeliever is excusable to a certain extent, but not to the extent that, despite witnessing thousands of miracles, marvels and signs, and in spite of realising the excellence of teaching and beholding pure Tawheed in Islam, he should go on saying, I am not satisfied. This concludes the answer to question 9. At this point of concluding answers to the nine questions with detailed answers, Promised Messiah Islam continued with the book by stating some other important issues which I shall endeavour to summarise for you herewith. First, Dr. Abdul Hakim Khan, in his own book, wrongly accused the Promised Messiah Islam that he had written somewhere that anyone who did not believe in him will be a disbeliever and cast into hell, even if the message had not reached his land. Promised Messiah Islam said this was a totally false imputation to him, and he wrote the following on page 222. I quote, Since I am the Promised Messiah and God has openly manifested heavenly signs in my support. Everyone who in the estimation of God has been furnished with sufficient evidence regarding my advent as the promised Messiah and has become aware of my claim shall be held accountable for no one can deliberately turn away with impunity from those who have been sent by God. End of quote. Promised Messiah al-Islam emphasized that this call for correction and justice was not just for himself, but for Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa, the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, since he had been sent to support him. Also on page 222, I quote, he said, He who has heard the call of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and had become aware of his advent, and who, in the estimation of God, has been furnished with sufficient evidence regarding the prophethood of the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and dies as a believer, as a disbeliever, sorry, he would be condemned to eternal hell. End of quote. The knowledge whether sufficient evidence was received lies with God alone. If the intelligent recognize the signs and merits of faith, but reject the messenger of God, they will belong to the highest degree of kufr, disbelief. Those of less intelligence, but who had sufficient evidence given them, will also be accountable for disbelief in the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, albeit to a lesser extent than disbelievers of the highest degree. Nevertheless, Promised Messiah emphasized it was not for him to determine the disbelief of any person. That was the prerogative of the Almighty regarding whether anybody had sufficient evidence or not to accept the truth. Promised Messiah al-Islam then wrote on page 224, I quote, Therefore, anyone who claims he has never been provided with sufficient evidence is himself responsible for his denial, and the onus of proof is upon him alone. He alone will be answerable as to how sufficient evidence was not furnished to him, despite all the evidence based on reason, and historical record, excellence of teaching, heavenly signs and guidance of every kind. 
End of quote. Promise Messiah Islam does recognize that those totally unaware of Islam and dying in that state, including minors, the insane, or residents of a land where the message had not reached, they will stand excused. Promise Messiah Islam then informs that Abdul Hakim and other opponents have accused him of vices similar to the accusations by Jews against Jesus Islam. He then left the dealing of those accusations in the hands of Allah Almighty, but points out that he benefits from God's constant grace despite a multitude of attacks such that his followers were increasing to hundreds of thousands, so he invoked the curse of Allah upon the liars. Promise Messiah al Islam wrote on page 228 as follows. I quote, In short, the dispute between us and the opponents has now reached the limit. He who has sent me will now himself adjudicate this case. If I am truthful, the heavens will certainly bear such strong testimony for me that people will tremble. End of quote. Promise Messiah Islam also set out his innocence on the same page. I quote, Bear well in mind that I am not a fabricator. I am the oppressed. I am not the imposter. I am the truthful. I have been wronged far too long. End of quote. Twenty-five years previously, Promise Messiah al-Islam received a revelation which was published in Brahina Ahmadiyya which said quote, A warner came into the world but the world accepted him not. Yet God shall accept him and demonstrate his truthfulness with mighty assaults. Promise Messiah al-Islam wrote it was time for the manifestation of the second sentence of that prophecy, namely, yet God shall accept him and demonstrate his truthfulness with mighty assaults. Promise Messiah al-Islam regretted that his opponents, like Abdul Hakim, had not benefited from the signs of the Almighty and had committed great injustices. Promise Messiah al-Islam then mentioned several of his other prophecies, such as those concerning Abdullah Atam, Ahmad Beg, Ahmad Beg's son-in-law, Lake Ram, and Muhammad Hussein Batalvi, and emphasized that they had been fulfilled, even though opponents tried to prove them false, and even though some were conditional, with fulfillment postponed. Most of these prophecies are to be dealt with again in more detail later in this book and will be covered in due course by me in later lectures. Abdul Hakim Khan, like others, tried to imply that Promised Messiah al-Islam's prophecies had been proved false. This despite the fact that he himself had previously published the words that you are the like of the Messiah, that you are the Messiah and you are the like of prophets. He also wrote of a dream in which he was informed of Hassan Beg dying of plague for opposing the promised Messiah Islam, which is what actually happened. However, in complete contradiction, he then wrote that the promised Messiah Islam was a Dajjal and Satan and made other accusations. So Abdul Hakim first testified testified to the truthfulness of the promised Messiah and then declared him to be, to be an imposter in the same book. He obviously was not in his right mental sen sense. There could not be a more glaring contradictory statement. 
he obviously tried to deceive the public by suggesting promised Messiah al-Islam's other prophecies had proved false as well. The promised Messiah al-Islam wrote at this stage that he had so far only mentioned a few prophecies which his opponents and their new recruit Abdul Hakim had repeatedly objected to. However, Promised Messiah al-Islam then wanted to demonstrate how large are the number of heavenly signs testifying to his truth. These are most numerous. But Promised Messiah al-Islam, by way of examples, wanted to include 140 of them. But, by the end of the book, they actually numbered over 200 signs. Some of them are prophecies made by earlier prophets some by spiritual elites from the Muslim Ummah and some manifested at his own hands. Promised Messiah then proceeded to record those signs for the benefits of Ahmadis. I shall go through some of them in these lectures. A few of them may be familiar to you as they have been included in Promised Messiah other books and in Ahmadiyya literature. I shall deal with them in the same numerical order but in shorter summary form. I now proceed to put before you selective signs presented by the Promised Messiah Islam proving the truthfulness of his claims as Promised Messiah and Mahdi. Sign number one. Abu Dawood in Hadith reports that the Holy Prophet said at the end of every century God will commission a mujaddid for this ummah who will revive the faith for its sake. At the time of Promised Messiah writing one century was nearing its end and it could not be said that any Hadith should remain unfulfilled. Malvis might question the authenticity of this hadith, but it had always been held valid by scholars of the Ummah. Promised Messiah said it was not essential to name all the Mujaddids, as that knowledge is exclusive to God alone. It was already universally agreed that the last Mujaddid of the Ummah would be the promised Messiah. Another issue is whether these are the latter days or not. Jews and Christians agreed that they were. Many calamities were appearing and 23 years of the 14th century had already passed. So the time for the promised Messiah was due. The promised Messiah al-Islam was in fact the only claimant in the field at the time. Once the cross broke God's truthful Masih. Now it was ordained for the new Masih, Messiah, to break the cross in the sense of eradicating belief in atonement from the world through heavenly signs. Sign number two. In Sunan Dar Qutni is a hadith by Imam M. Al Baqir which says there are two signs for our Mahdi which ever since God created the heavens and earth these two signs have never appeared at the time of any other appointed one or messenger. One of them is that at the time of the promised Mahdi, during the month of Ramzan, the lunar eclipse will take place on its first night, i.e. on the 13th night, whilst the solar eclipse will take place in the middle of its days, i.e. on the 28th day of the same Ramzan. Such phenomenon has never occurred at the time of any messenger or prophet.
since the beginning of the world. It is destined to occur only at the time of the promised Mahdi. It is recorded that the lunar and solar eclipses, as described, did take place in promised Messiah al-Islam's time during Ramazan. These eclipses occurred twice in Ramzan, first in India and then again in America. Both times it was exactly in accord with the Hadith's prophecy. There were no other claimants for the promised Mahdi in the world except the promised Messiah al-Islam. No other person claimed the eclipses for his own support. So the heavenly sign had to be specifically appointed for the promised Messiah al-Islam. In fact, God had informed the promised Messiah al-Islam accordingly twelve years previously and it had been recorded in Brahina Ahmadiyya and become widely known. The opponents objected to this sign by mixing up the dates and by misreading the Hadith. The Hadith means that the two eclipses have never occurred together in Ramzan. Not that they have never occurred during Ramzan. One objection questions the validity of the Hadith itself. But the Promised Messiah explained and overcame such objections. Sign number three. This was the appearance of a comet destined to appear in the time of the promised Messiah. In fact, it did so appear, prompting even Christian English newspapers to speculate that the time of the Messiah's advent had come. Now, as I said before, there are many more signs that Promised Messiah al Islam has lift, listed in this book. In fact, there are 208 of them. And whilst I shall not be going through every single one, but selectively I will go through them in numerical order in future lectures, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.